following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. They've got a ton of adoption. Basically, everybody's using some graphs in, in, in some component. I think it's critical. I think, you know, if we want to have the data component of what's happening on blockchain is digestible, it has to be part of the decentralized stack. Today I'm speaking with AJ Warner, Chief Strategy Officer at Offchain Labs, the founding team behind Arbitrum, an L2 offering a suite of scaling solutions for Ethereum. In addition to being one of the most well-known L2 solutions in the Ethereum community, Arbitrum is top of mind for members of the Graph ecosystem for two primary reasons. First, Arbitrum was recently announced as one of the new chains being added to the MIPS program, and indexers are currently working to support the chain on the decentralized network. And secondly, it was recently announced that the Graph Network would be scaling to Arbitrum in order to lower the costs and barriers of participation in the protocol. During this interview, AJ talks about his background in business, law, and real estate, his journey into Web3 and crypto, what an L2 is, what makes Arbitrum different and how it works, and then he helps break down all the recent news that's happening between the Graph and Arbitrum. As always, we started the conversation talking about AJ's professional and educational experience, which included a stint as a freelance sports writer. Sure. All right, well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Nick. I really appreciate joining you. So I have a pretty non-traditional background from this space, but I feel like everybody kind of has a non-traditional background. There's no uh, blockchain uh, degree in college. Um, I went to Yeshiva University for undergrad in New York after growing up in Toronto. Um, and living in Canada for the first 18 years of my life. Um, study economics. Actually, that's where I met Stephen Goldfeder, co-founder and CEO of Offchain Labs. After undergrad, I did a JD MBA at NYU with a focus on real estate and finance. And that's really where I thought my career was going to go. Graduated school in 2017, went to uh, Paul Hastings, which is a large uh, international law firm, and focused on real estate development. Most of my clients were New York City developers, you know, either buying buildings in Manhattan or developing new projects in Manhattan. And I was always passionate about blockchain, crypto generally, but it was always more of like a hobby or a side thing for me. And then obviously took the plunge um, in 2020 full time into the space. But you know, really, my professional career, you know, was rooted in the New York City real estate. So every once in a while, when I do research about a guest, I come across these nuggets of things that make them different from any other prior guest. And in your particular case, you're the first freelance sports writer that I've had on the podcast before. What can you share with us about what you did as a freelance sports writer? That was a fun time. So when I was in college, I decided, you know, I'm a big sports fan. I like to write. So why don't I start combining these two things? Um, I used to write posts for um, Bleacher Report, which is like a community created and a more of a more professional um, content creation platform. But my, my two most exciting pieces were actually in my local paper in Toronto. So I'm a big hockey fan, like most Canadians and Toronto Maple Leafs fan in particular. And there were two players that were free agents and the whole community of Toronto basically thought that they, they were worth like way less than I thought their valuations were. So I cold called the editor of Toronto star and I said, I want to write some pieces why these players are, you know, worth more than people seem to think. He said, all right, you got 30 seconds to make your pitch. And I did. And he said, all right, if you can get me something in the next 48 hours, I'll publish it. So I basically stayed up all night. I have no experience in this. And then it was pretty cool. Um, they took it. They ran with it. I was on the front page of the sports section with a little picture of myself, an aspiring sports writer. It came with a lot of hate mail, but it was a really fun experience. Um, after doing two of those, though, I realized that journalism is not for me. It's uh you got to deal with a lot of people who are very passionate and get very angry. And, you know, I just didn't have the, the bones for it. It's an incredible story, especially the way you got involved. I'm curious if you 
use any of the skills that you learned at that time, though, as a sports writer and what you do now? I think that one of the themes that like went through that hobby, went through me going through um, law school and business school, and then the work I was doing before and some of that was very focused on, I would say, analysis, analytics, and probably taking like a pretty measured approach to decision making. And I think that that um, is a pretty common thread, actually. You know, one of the things that, that just, you know, was like the crux of my, my piece in that was, you know, we're letting our emotions take advantage of determining what the value of this player is. This is cold hearted analysis of what it looks like. You know, when you're, a, when you're a corporate lawyer, you obviously have to show empathy, but you, you know, there's law, there's contract, there's rights for your clients and you have to vigorously defend those rights. So it's a lot of that, like, analysis and you know similar now with with what i do at off chain labs whenever we questions of like growth for the ecosystem sustainability of the ecosystem collaborations partnerships etc a lot of those times you have to take a very measured approach with everything sounds amazing and everything sounds cool and, and you have to sort of understand like where's the business going you know what makes the most sense where we are today what will make the most sense in the future i think that's probably the common threads so i don't know if i use any of like the actual skills but it's probably the same thing that you know excites me about what i do today and excited me about what I did in that hobby is probably um, pretty similar. Well, as you mentioned, you studied law and before you went to work in crypto and off-chain labs, you were going to be an attorney. And I'm curious what drew your interest into that field. Do you remember why you decided to pursue law? And, and of course, you got the JD MBA, so you did business as well. Yeah. So so one thing that is interesting. So I, I, I knew I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to be a lawyer and I practiced for three years. The one thing I knew the entire time was that I never wanted to be a litigator. I never wanted to go to court. And the, and the breakdown really in like the legal system is you have, you know, in the United States, at least in like the larger firms where people specialize or from an earlier, and you can become a corporate lawyer, which is like, you, know, you do transactions, you become a litigator, which is you do a lot of research, write briefs, you know, go to court, settle. And the, the fundamental difference between these two things is how important is collaboration in what you're doing? So in litigation, folks are not really so collaborative because it's not a repeat relationship, right? I sued you. I probably never want to see you again. You probably never want to see me again. So everybody's trying to get the best deal that they can for themselves. In corporate law, everybody knows everybody, right? So you can do the same deal. I might buy a building from you today and I'm going to buy your other building tomorrow. And if we don't have a good relationship on this one, then the next one is not going to go well, right? And I saw that throughout my career in law was the balance between making sure you get the best deal today and also making sure that you have the best relationships and are maintaining proper relationships to continue to grow your business, to continue to grow your, you know, your counterparty's business so that everybody's kind of happy. And that's always been something that I've really liked about what I did. You know, you have at the end of the day, everybody's obviously stressed at the end of the day. The best feeling is when both sides are happy with a deal. And, you know, in hindsight, somebody always gets a better deal and somebody always gets a worse deal. But that feeling in the moment of both sides being happy with the deal is really what you strive for when you're a corporate lawyer. And I love that. And I think that is one of the fundamental tenets of Web3 generally, right? Nobody is here to try and suck somebody else dry. It's not the business models that we're trying to create. We're trying to create sustainable business models of open public software that anybody can use and build upon and compose and be collaborative and, you know, create value together. And that's what we do a lot, obviously, with our work at Arbitrum. That's what we do generally with our work, working with partners. Like, how do we help and make you succeed because your success is our success? And obviously, it's a little bit different than a corporate real estate environment where you're talking about buying a TV screen in Times Square. But a lot of it's the same where If you don't have a collaborative mindset, a collaborative attitude, you're going to get shunned by the street pretty quickly um, and people are just not going to want to work with you. And that's one of the things that I think has probably served me really well in my current job is is that ability to understand how games and cycles are played in relationships. Because in crypto, everybody knows everybody. And it's important. Your reputation is extremely important um, as a counterparty. So you're an interesting person because you've got this incredible career track, right? You've got a JD MBA from a great university. You're in the biggest city in the world to start pursuing a career in real estate and in law and business. 
And yet at some point you become aware of crypto and decide to do a whole career change. If we go back in time, when was that? When did you first get interested in crypto? Yeah. So these timelines are not completely perfectly aligned. So I graduated in 2017, but my interest and passion for crypto began really in 2014. Um, when I was in NYU, I took a class seminar on Bitcoin. It was That's really what it was. Ethereum didn't exist yet. You had obviously some of these other small coins that, you know, obviously today don't really have much relevance, but were part of what people were trading, the, the online casinos, et cetera. But really it was all about Bitcoin. And the thing that resonated the most with me, you know, 2014, we're, we're exiting an era of like quantitative easing, massive amount of capital flooding the system. The thing that always drove me a little bit crazy about the current American financial system was like the lack of sovereignty in the system, right? And it's like all of these centralized controls, these set, like the bankers were just pumping in money, quantitative easing, right? What are the effects on that? Like inflation has adverse impact much more on lower class than the upper class. And like, how do we think about that? What is the effect? And it always kind of irked me. And I'll give you like an example of some of that. Like, it still bothers me today and like is a great example of this. You know, we have all these accredited investor laws in this country, but basically anyone can get a credit card that has them paying 18% interest, right? And it's like, if you want to talk about how things are set up for certain parts of the community and certain parts of our country to fail, credit card debt is like a extremely scary for a lot of the people, but it's so easy to get the exposure to that debt at 18%. But if I want to invest in a you know a great private company, I can't, right? And like that to me always felt um, like an example of you know how the system takes away sovereignty. And I would say that that was one of the things that really interested me most about the technology. When I was in law school, a bunch of crazy things were happening in Bitcoin. The Mt. Gox hack occurred. Charlie Schrem was arrested for his role in sort of facilitating transactions in Silk Road. Uh, I did a lot of work when I was there, like interviewing with his lawyers, understanding his case, understanding the ramifications of his case, what it meant for money transmission, what it meant for the viability of this as like a peer-to-peer cash. That stuff all really interested me a lot. Throughout the time, I continued being interested. Then Ethereum launched, and that to me was like a whole other level of interesting technology because it took something from just money to sort of infrastructure that you can build upon and have a vision of like a, a permissionless sovereign environment, and it, which was extremely powerful. And for the first few years, it was like so hard to appreciate what that looked like because there was like nothing but like terrible applications that lived on top, right? Like there was nothing interesting to do. Like, you know, this is pre-Uniswap, right? This is 2015, 2016. Like it was hard to imagine what it was, but the mental framework I always had, and, you know, it's still kind of exists today when I think about Bitcoin and Ethereum is Bitcoin is gold and Ethereum is oil. And with oil, you can do a ton of things from an innovation perspective, right? You know, powers our cars, it powers transportation, it powers airplanes. And obviously it will take time for those things to be developed. And that's really, I think, how I view like decentralized applications on top of Ethereum. So that takes me through basically... Um, all this time. And during this time, like Stephen, like I said, we went to college together. In 2014, we were the only one in our friendship circles that cared about this stuff. So we kept, we kept close. 2017, he comes and starts telling me about Arbitrum, about what they're doing. And I became actually their lawyer when I was at Paul Hastings. We helped get the company off the ground. We helped found the company from a legal perspective, helped them through their seed investment, etc. I continued my legal career. Kept, you know, chatting with the team, Harry, Ed, and Stephen, the founders. When they launched on Testnet in 2020, uh, Stephen reached out and said, hey, I, there's really something for you to do now as someone who's non-technical to help contribute value to build this ecosystem. And I basically quit my job that week, and that's when I joined full-time. So, like, that's the full story of sort of how my legal career and my interest and excitement in this space kind of, like, the timelines overlap. Yeah, I mean, there was a two-year period, I think 2019 to 2020, I was you know, working full-time in real estate and spending all day in my, like my private time just keeping up to speed. So it was nice to have to shed the, the full-time you know, real estate stuff. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, pooling, dApps, 
sub grafts, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graft Foundation. That's the Graft Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and the graph. Welcome back. I want to go back to something you said about your first impressions of Bitcoin in 2014. And for listeners that aren't familiar with what is meant by accredited investor, regulation in the United States has designated that you have, must have a certain level of income or net worth to be able to invest in certain types of assets. You said that the, the light bulb moment with Bitcoin was it might enable sovereignty. And I'm just curious if you could explore that a little bit for listeners that don't make that one-to-one connection or maybe haven't explored this idea before, but how does Bitcoin address this question or concern about sovereignty? Yeah, um, this is also a little bit personal to me. You know, I, it's not an analogy that I thought of, but it resonated with me a lot. So I don't know if you're familiar with Ari Paul. He's one of the founders of Block Tower Capital, but he used to talk about this a lot where I have a Jewish background. My grandparents weren't in the Holocaust, but you know, most of my friends' grandparents were. My grandparents on my mom's side fled from religious persecution in the Soviet Union in the 70s. and they left everything behind. Those were the trade-offs that they had to make, right? Leaving all of their material possessions for sort of the world that they wanted their children to live in. And if there was a digital parallel to that, and, you know, again, it's not the simplest thing to conceive of, but that could have been a very different reality for them, right? Going from a comfortable life in a country that they didn't want to live in to sort of starting all over again in their 40s from a financial perspective because they didn't have a digital store of value that they can take with them, you know, in the form of a seed phrase. And obviously times change, but I think about sort of just my family's perspective, you know, my community's perspective, like a lot of the suffering that people went through, how much that was tied to the fact they didn't have the ability to have sovereign control of what their assets looked like because it was in the form that couldn't be transferred. So I, I think that that is... You know, an example that's not like a regulatory example of something that's always resonated with me, but from a regulatory perspective, um, obviously there's laws that you know have to follow in this world, but I'm not definitely not advocating for anybody not to follow the rules and the laws of any country that they live in, but it is incredibly empowering to have even something as simple as an NFT, you know, live in a self-custodied wallet that you control that belongs to you. You don't need to have a custodian. It's just, it's an incredibly empowering thing to think about what that means from an ownership perspective, you can take it anywhere in the world. We're seeing it play out with Bitcoin now where, you know, we don't talk about the adoption from a peer-to-peer perspective living in the United States, but if you look at places like Argentina, Venezuela, Lebanon, there really is, you know, people are really starting to consider this and stable coins to be, to be fair, you know, on, on Ethereum as alternative forms of wealth storage, no, not necessarily creation, but, but even just wealth storage. And that's, really important component in the ability for somebody to to sort of maintain a sovereign self. I have to ask you this question about what you told friends and family as you in 2020 decide to change careers and go into this new emerging industry. What were those conversations like? They were interesting. Um, if my mom ever listens to this, she'll know the truth. Um, you know, for my, my, my parents didn't really get it, to be honest. Like for them, obviously I, I have two children. I was married, you know, the way they think about this, the way most people think about it, the way I think about it is, you know, you're, you know, making sure you can support your family is the most important thing. You have to understand how, what kind of risks you're taking. I had confidence in myself and in the team that I was joining in the product that we were building, that this was going to be something that was worth it. But also for, from my personal perspective, and if, even if this wasn't the company, this was the industry for me, right? This was the mission that I was going to get fulfillment professionally to continue down a path. You know, I always believe you have to love what you're doing in order to be excellent at it. I liked real estate. I sometimes loved real estate, but I definitely s- understood that there were people, even at where I was working, who cared about it professionally more than I did, which would mean that they were likely to be more successful at me than, than I would be at it. 
I was extremely passionate about this industry, what this industry can do, who this could empower in the world. And that I had to move basically. So, you know, when I explained that um, to my family, also, I was at the point in my career where if this didn't work out, like I'm sure I could have figured out a way to return. I had, you know, very strong relationships and I had a, a, a skill set, but I had some sort of safety net, I would say. But this was more about just joining something I was passionate about. I'll, I'll never forget one of the partners that I worked closely with when I told him I'm leaving. He goes, of course you should do this. Like, you know, obviously I was, there was a hole in his team with, with, with me leaving, um, which I'm sure he filled pretty quickly. But but he knew this was the right thing for me. And he said, if you ever want to come back, he's always here. But go crush it, basically. And that was that meant a lot to me because um, he knew that this was the right move for me, which you know made it feel right to me. When I told my friends, they're all like, this is a no-brainer. You spend every minute of every day talking about this thing. It's ridiculous that you're doing something else. So definitely some risk. Um, definitely some, you know, my wife was extremely supportive, which was a huge help. So, you know, it's really about understanding what, you know, what you can and can't do, your support systems. It's not for everybody to go from sort of a traditional job that pays the bills to something that obviously has a lot more risk built into it. But I say the principle of do something that you care about more than others is likely to lead you to have more success is, is a pretty reasonable perspective to take. A lot of my listeners are looking for ways to go full time into Web3. And so a story like yours is inspiring, but also informative. What do you wish you would have known then that you know now about making that move that might be helpful? Yeah, so I think so. I would say a few things have changed since then, right? I think 2020 versus, I guess, early 2023. The industry as a whole has become a lot more de-risked, right? So you don't have, like, when I was switched, you know, a lot of my um, colleagues at work were like, you're nuts, basically, because, but now everybody has friends who are working in Web3. It's like working in a tech startup for the most part. It's, it, from a social perspective, it's very de-risked. And I think it's important to appreciate that, that distinction, right? You don't go, you're not viewed as somebody who's, you know, joining cult that believes in like scam internet money you're going you know you're, you're 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 joining companies and products that are trying to build out sort of the next evolution the next generation of the, of the internet which i think is critical so i think in some ways it's de-risked but the, the flip side to that it's also become much more competitive you know we see a ton of resumes of incredible resumes and you know if you stacked my resume against these resumes i would have no shot of getting the, the job i got because it's really competitive right now because a lot of people are excited about the technology and, you know, these things are related, right? The lack of risk, you know, as an industry and who it attracts. The thing I would say that I wish I did differently, and, you know, obviously I'm fortunate to be where I am, but if I did it again, I would do this is there are so many opportunities to get involved publicly, even if you're not working full time in this space, take advantage of that. There are so many people who have gotten jobs, even on my team, there's a few people who we have on our team. I discovered them on Twitter. That's how they got their jobs, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's a benefit of the ecosystem. It's a very small ecosystem in terms of like, you know, if, if you build a reputation for yourself on Discord or on Twitter, people will respect you. It doesn't matter if you're anonymous, not anonymous, like whoever you are, you know, people respect your opinions and your thoughts and you can contribute so much value. Like you see some of these folks building on like, for example, dashboards and analytic dashboards and like Dune, and it's incredible, right? Like how much value, how much analysis they're doing and providing. And you can do all of that to build up, you know, your knowledge base, also build up your, you know, your skill set and exposure within the ecosystem. The other thing I would say is people are extremely approachable. You don't have the sort of, like everybody wants to help, right? I get reached out a lot from different people. Can I talk to you about my career? You know, can you take a look at this deck? We're trying to build a seed, you know, build a seed round and I'm happy to help. You know, I'm trying to pay it forward as people help me, but take advantage of that. It's, you know, not everybody, people are very busy so not everyone will have time, but people generally are very welcoming and looking to grow the pie of what this industry looks like. But take advantage of that. Obviously, you know, don't waste people's time, but if you have, you know, good questions, if you have ideas that you want to bounce off of, if you want introductions, People are generally, you know, pretty helpful. And I did not leverage those two things enough. I'm, you know, naturally pretty shy. I've gotten over that a little bit now, but I barely talked on Twitter about crypto. And that was just because I just 
prefer to read and consume from people who I had a little bit of an imposter syndrome, probably still do a bit, but definitely did then um, about like what I can contribute. But you shouldn't because, you know, you might see something stupid, but you'll learn that why it's stupid. People will definitely tell you on crypto Twitter why it's stupid. But the next time, you know, you'll understand and you'll, I'm sure, have valuable contributions to make. So I would say take advantage of the resources and the inclusivity and the collaborative environment of the ecosystem you're joining because people are, people are happy to help. Where do you come in on this debate that's happening on Twitter right now as it comes to what to call the industry, right? I've, I've seen a couple loud voices within the industry saying, we, sh- we should have never said Web3. It should have just stayed crypto. And then there's the converse of that argument, right? It should always be Web3 and never mention crypto. Where do you come in on that debate? It's a good one. I like that question. Um, I think it depends who you're talking to. I think it's really important to, for us to understand that there isn't one narrative that will capture for everybody why people care about what we're doing. And I'll give you an example, right? Like in Arbitrum, the, the roots of Arbitrum's growth, if you go back to the launch of the network, was definitely in DeFi. And there's a DeFi culture in crypto, and that's crypto. But now as we're building out the gaming environment, that's a Web3 environment. It's like, what are the differences? I think the differences come down to sort of what are the users and the developers in these different verticals looking to get out of the technology, right? So for DeFi people, it might be financial opportunities for people who wouldn't have those financial opportunities if it wasn't for DeFi, right? Like they wouldn't have the ability to open up an account and swap and buy ETH, or they don't have the ability to, to, make, to make options trades because they're not accredited investors. And for them, it's about sovereignty. And you know, that, those are the key rights. You know, for gamers, they don't care as much about the security and these principles. For them, it's about like the ownership of the assets. And are you the product or are you the user in the Web 2 versus Web 3 debate, right? The, business, the nature of the business models. And I think they don't care so much. I, the reason I call it crypto, and I think the, the reason is like the cryptographic components of the underlying blockchains in which these assets are built on, it's not as important to them versus other, other themes. So understanding, I think, what do people care about? Is it the efficiencies? Is it the sovereignty? Is it the permissionless activity? Is it composability? Really, I think impact. My default is crypto, but I've been getting more into you know saying Web3 because I think a lot of people like to hear it. If Web3 becomes the term, the brand for the industry, if you forecast out, does Web3 coexist with Web2? Or do you think at some point Web3 replaces Web2? That's, again, another hotly debated topic out there on Twitter and other places. What's your perspective? I think they coexist, personally. I think one of the things that we're making a mistake right now in our industry is making the assumption that every business model needs to be like flipped on its head. For some use cases, like Web2 business models, they just work. They make the most sense. We talk about, like for example, like you know, decentralizing Uber. And like, that's always the, you know, the classic example of like, you know, why do we need a central company? We can have a peer to peer, you know, ride sharing network of drivers and users, and there wouldn't have to be an extraction from a middleman. And then like, when you think about it though, in practice, like that middleman is the one who ensures that like the users are safe, ensures the screening of the drivers. Right. And like, maybe in like a very long time, there will be like AI and systems that can replace that in a more efficient way. But like conceptually, if we just had, you know, peer to peer Uber today, I don't think as a society, we would be better off, right? I think that, you know, 90% of instances, people might be better off because they wouldn't be paying the extraction fee from the middlemen. But in those 10% of cases, I think the these disasters would be like horrifying, right? So I think that, you know, we have to understand and like, and this could be a strip extreme, right? Like there are some obvious use cases. I think like the earliest ones that we think about are like cross-border money payments, right? Like, yes, I think like disrupting Western Union and how much they take is is a very reasonable use case for what we're doing. And like, I'm fully behind replacing as a business model, right? And But we're even seeing that in Web 2. Like, you know, Web 3, I think your crypto can do this cheaper. And I think that's a great example. But there are other examples like the, the Uber one where I think, you know, sometimes we come with like a hammer and say everything's got to be decentralized where there's definitely a spectrum of things that you do or don't want to be decentralized. And I think there's a lot of things 
right now that like let's just let's let's let, let's focus on on the things that we can focus on. I think gaming is a great example, right? Where you have this there's such an obvious market of like, wow, we can create these, you know, in-game assets and make them tradable and actually owned. I mean, that's amazing. You have to remember, like, the overwhelming majority of people who play a game just want to have fun, right? So I think that's a great example of like where the principles where we have where like sovereignty and ownership and like value for your work can sometimes not 100% align with like the reality of what most people in the world really want. And I think, you know, we, we started with like a lot of the play to earn games, which, you know, I don't think have a long term horizon of sustainability and growth and interest because again, people want to play fun games, right? So right now we're in a journey of how do we take that path of combining a game so that it's super fun with taking the things that can be added from web three to make that experience better for the user as a whole. I think that's like where we're going. I think the game, the evolution of blockchain gaming, I think is a great example of, you know, how we should incorporate and shouldn't incorporate web to, you know, business models and experiences into what we're doing. Stopping short of full disruption. And I appreciate the point that you made there about not every industry is ripe for disruption from web three and crypto. But when you look back on your days in real estate and in law, are there moments where you see, oh, wow. This would be very helpful. Blockchain or crypto would be very helpful in a couple scenarios uh, that exist in, in that industry. Oh, 100%. I mean, one of the things that I was doing, especially when I was a junior, we had these very complicated mortgage loans that were getting sold and split up into this is one of the things that caused, like, you know, the big short of seeing the movie. They take these mortgages, they split them into different notes with different risk profiles, and they sell them to different lenders. The amount of paper and inefficiency that goes into those systems is insane, right? Like there's a whole middle ground of like lawyers and bankers. There's a lot of disruption there if you had more efficient systems. I think that that's probably true for many mutual fund, robo-advisors, all these different kind of... But again, a lot of those efficiencies are happening on the Web2 side also. Like you see, if you just look at the, for example, like, going from the mutual funds of the 80s to the vanguards of the world, like the spread in fees has come down significantly. So the question is like, of how do we bring this onto the blockchain? One of the value propositions of the blockchain, to me, is much more about transparency, right? The ability for people to A, know their assets actually exist, but B, have simple transfers, right? So like, do you have to call a broker or can you just execute something yourself? Is you don't think about it, but that's a 10x user experience improvement. like. Uh, you know, I had to take something out of Schwab recently from like, or transfer and like, took me like two hours and four days, right? And like, yes, like they've made that a simple experience from a fee perspective, but it's still a mess from a transparency perspective in a way that I think a lot of blockchain infrastructure, you know, can make that a way easier. The trade off is, is that it's way easier for me today because I'm crypto native, right? I understand how to use a MetaMask. The challenge I think we have now, and I've been pretty vocal about this actually lately, is I think we're at a point in blockchain technology where the product and user experience is really where the ball is in the court, right? For like scale. Like right now, like obviously, like Arbitrum, we're trying to scale throughput and speeds and efficiency of using Ethereum. But I think that the product ex user experience has to scale. And I think that is. Critical. Like my mom would have absolutely no idea how to use MetaMask or how to use any almost any of these wallets in a non in a self custodial way, right? Like I think some of the centralized exchange products are more advanced for non crypto native users, but we have to get the self custody environments right. And this goes into account abstraction and smart contract wallets and all the different things that you know our team is looking at and doing research in. You know, I think like Argent you know, as, as a wallet, for example, or many other wallets are looking at that. I think that's where we're at right now, where there's definitely efficiencies, but we need to have the product that can implement these efficiencies become as user-friendly as possible. Well, AJ, you and I are talking today because there's a lot of news within the graph ecosystem about Arbitrum and scaling to L2. Before we get to that, can you talk a little bit about off-chain labs. You've mentioned it a couple times, what it is and what its relationship is with Arbitrum. 
Yeah, sure. So Off Chain Labs is pretty simple. Is the company that has developed and built the Arbitrum protocol, essentially, on top of Ethereum. So we have two public chains live right now, Arbitrum 1, which is a roll-up chain, and Arbitrum Nova, which is what we call any trust technology, um, very similar with some trade-offs for security for lower costs. And those are both projects that were incubated by Offchain Labs. Um, recently, Offchain Labs acquired Prismatic Labs, which is the team that built Prism, the ETH consensus client. So that's part of the Offchain Labs family as well. The mission of Offchain Labs is to scale Ethereum. And that is combining both support for the Prism software on the staking side, and obviously, you know, primarily focusing on developing Arbitrum as a scaling platform built on top of Ethereum to allow the world to access it, both developers and users, in a very cost-effective way. So a lot of listeners won't really understand what an L2 is and the fact that Arbitrum is built on top of Ethereum. It gets a little bit convoluted. For the basic listener, how would you kind of help them sort through what all that means? Yeah, sure. And it's probably helpful to sort of take a step back and think about the different components of building blockchains for a second, because I think that would be helpful context. So first blockchain, let's just call it Bitcoin, is very good for value transfer, but doesn't have much else that it can do. It can't do smart contracts, right? So all of these complex activities like launching Uniswap, you know, needs programmability on the blockchain that something like Bitcoin doesn't have. So you need a blockchain that is much more flexible in nature. Um, and Ethereum is the first example of this. So when you think about scaling blockchains and using blockchain technology for these applications, you quickly run into something called a blockchain scalability trilemma. And a trilemma generally means you can have two out of three things, but you cannot achieve all three things at the same time. And in Ethereum, it's throughput, decentralization, and security. So We'll focus really on you know the throughput trade-off, but the point here is Ethereum by design limits the throughput of the network because they're primarily focused on maintaining its decentralization and security. So Ethereum allows basically, I think it's on average like 13 transactions per second to take place on the network. The software can support more, but the reason why it doesn't do more than that is because if we want, you know, Nick, AJ, any of these listeners to be able to run nodes on reasonable software, they need to have the ability to run that software themselves. And you want it to not be too expensive. Otherwise, people will not run nodes. So that's where the limitations come into effect. And because you have this limitation, that is why Ethereum gets so expensive. And the reason for that is, you know, it can do 13 transactions per second, but there's more than 13 transactions per second of demand. So an auction mechanism is implemented where whoever is willing to pay the most will be put into the next block in those 13 transactions per second. And that's why sometimes Ethereum gas prices go way up because we have these limitations. So how, that's where Arbitrum comes in and layer two technologies. And the goal of rollups, which Arbitrum is, and we'll describe it in a second, is to help solve Ethereum scalability trilemma by separating the decentralization of Ethereum from the throughput environments, what we call the execution environments like Arbitrum. So how does Arbitrum work? Arbitrum to users, whoever's used it before can tell, it looks and feels exactly like a blockchain. In reality, though, it is a set of smart contracts that lives on top of Ethereum. And when you do a transaction on Arbitrum, let's say I you know, buy an NFT on OpenSea and Nick, you do a swap on Uniswap. What the protocol does is it takes all of these transactions that we do on Arbitrum, it compresses the data and posts that data to Ethereum on behalf of the Arbitrum users. And that brings the costs down significantly. And the reason for that is twofold. So one is, from a data perspective, it's compressing it. So only posts the data that you need to recreate the transaction. But two, when you do a transaction on Ethereum, what you're telling Ethereum's validators to do is to store the data, but also to execute the transaction. And that, from a resource perspective, is extremely expensive. So by taking the execution of the transaction and doing it on Arbitrum, and only the data going to Ethereum, you can bring down the cost significantly. 
So a transaction like a Uniswap trade that might be $5 on Ethereum might be 12 cents on Arbitrum. And that's because the compressed data that exists of this transaction that's posted to Ethereum is all you really need. So what happens? You know you have the data that occurred on Arbitrum posted to Ethereum. So if Arbitrum fell over tomorrow, you can recreate the entire state of the chain based on the data that's been posted to Ethereum without Arbitrum. But this is the secret sauce of rollups and where everybody's solving is how do we know the data that was posted to Ethereum by the Arbitrum protocol is true, correct, and complete? So when I say that AJ bought this NFT and Nick did this Uniswap trade, maybe AJ spent $12 on the NFT, but according to the data that was posted, I spent $10 and I I should have a $2 balance in my wallet. So what happens is that's when you get to the proving mechanisms. So Arbitrum uses what we call an optimistic rollup prover or a fraud prover. And then there's something called ZK rollups, which use zero knowledge proofs. I work on Arbitrum, so I'm going to focus on the optimistic rollup side. So what happens is, is whoever posted the call data to Ethereum, a challenge period is open where anybody can challenge and say the data that was posted by that validator was incorrect. This is the correct data. And in reality, everybody will know, anybody who's running a node will be, knows what the correct state is, but basically a challenge goes back and forth between the two validators, where the validator that wins slashes the other validator, and the correct data is posted to Ethereum. All that adjudication happens on Ethereum based on the different updates that were made to Ethereum. So that's how really the mechanism for knowing that the data that was posted from Arbitrum to Ethereum is true, correct, and complete. In reality, this shouldn't happen because if everybody's running nodes and they know what the right data is, somebody would only challenge if they want to lose money in the stake, right? Because like they're going to lose money unless there was like a software bug, obviously. So we, you know, in practice, we actually haven't had a challenge live on the Arbitrum One mainnet because there hasn't been any fraud posted by a validator. But we did have it actually in the proof of work for, and this is actually pretty cool. So. You know, obviously, Ethereum went through the merge in September, where it went from a proof of work environment to proof of stake environment. I'm sure most of your listeners know what that is, but it went from you know miners doing the work to a stake validator set. What happened though was when that fork happened, was the proof of work Ethereum chain continued to exist. So because Arbitrum again is a set of smart contracts, it existed on both networks: the proof of stake chain and the forked proof of work chain, which is obviously abandoned to date that nobody's using, et cetera. But somebody tried submitting an invalid proof and draining the Arbitrum bridge on the proof of work network of all of the ETH that was living there, all of the ETH proof of work tokens. Somebody in our team in his own spare time was actually running a validator though, and he caught the invalid state proof and he challenged it in real life. So we know the software works in a real environment. We're just obviously, I don't think that the attacker on the proof of work network expected anybody to be defending the state of the network, but it was nice to see it play out properly and in, in, in real time. But that's really you know how rollups work. And that's how you get the scalability because Arbitrum can do about 10x the throughput of Ethereum right now at between 50 and 100x the fees of what it costs to use Ethereum. And it just posts that compressed data. So if Ethereum was doing 13 transactions a second and an Arbitrum environment could do 10x, you know, you've got a 10x order of magnitude improvement. That's just Arbitrum. And there's other roll-up environments that are, you know, that are contributing that. These are all working in parallel where we can get obviously, you know, massive throughput increases over what Ethereum can do on the base layer. And that's why we call it Ethereum's roll-up centric roadmap, because it allows the scalability trilemma of execution and throughput to be divorced from you know, the decentralization and security perspectives because Ethereum is not expected to do the throughput. The way I like to like, uh, you know, describe it to you know, my friends and family who aren't in crypto, the rollups are like Venmo and PayPal's of the world where like, users use it every day. But under the hood, you know that the banks that are using Venmo and PayPal are settling with each other. right? At the end of the day, they're all finalizing what their ledgers look like. That's what Ethereum looks like, right? All these roll-up environments are you're doing where you're doing your economic activity, and then the Ethereum layer is settling everything. In the same way that, like, if I wanted to send you ten bucks or we went to get a coffee, I wouldn't send you a wire, right? Like, that's just not how our infrastructure is set up. If everybody was sending wires, that system would would collapse. 
that's kind of how Ethereum is designed. You know, use the equivalent of them or use Arbitrum and we'll settle to Ethereum. So that's how I like to think about it. Hi, this is AJ with Offchain Labs, the team developing the Arbitrum Protocol. If my conversation with the GRTIQ podcast has been helpful to you, then please consider supporting future episodes by becoming a subscriber. Visit grtiq.com slash podcast for more information. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. podcast. Thanks for listening. Well, that's a brilliant analogy, and it really helped me understand this environment, and I'm sure it'll be very useful to listeners as well. I want to ask you this question about the future of L2s, and I want to ask it because obviously we're living in, and it looks like we're going forward in a multi-chain future, but there's this component of L2s, which are, of course, built on L1s. And so what's the future of L2s? I mean, are they the multi-chain future, or how does that look in your mind? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think that I'm an Ethereum maxi. I think, you know, I love Ethereum. I think everything can be built on Ethereum, should be built on Ethereum. It just takes time because, again, Ethereum always prioritizes security and decentralization. So if, you, if those are your priorities, throughput, scale will take longer to, to implement in other environments that have the ability to move quicker because they also, frankly, don't have you know, billions of dollars of assets and financial activity, you know, at stake. I believe in a multi-chain L2 future where a lot of people are doing a lot of different things that are going to be basically designed to optimize for the Ethereum experience. And I'll give you an example of what, what this means. We have two chains, just an Arbitrum alone, Arbitrum 1 and Arbitrum Nova. And Arbitrum 1 is the optimistic rollup. All of the call data is posted to Ethereum. That's how you get from like the $5 to like the 12 cents that I was describing in a transaction. But there are certain use cases and the 12 cents is just call data posted to Ethereum. That's it. You know, that's as most that can get compressed. You know, we're doing work within the Ethereum community. A lot of my colleagues are working on this too called EIP4844 to basically make rollups even cheaper to post to Ethereum. But fundamentally, if we're talking about today, January 2023, the limitation is that you still have to post call data. And for certain use cases, 12 cents is still too expensive, right? You can't have a game that, you know, is trying to sell assets for 50 cents or, you know, 25 cents and there's a 12 cent transaction fee. It just, it doesn't work. And frankly, those assets don't need the security of Ethereum. It's not worth it to them to have their security there versus in a, let's say, a less secure environment. So that's why we developed Arbitrum Nova. And the way Nova works is it's very similar. It's the same code base as Arbitrum 1. The only difference is it doesn't post the call data to Ethereum. It posts the call data to a data availability committee of you know, a hosted set of distributed you know, institutions that are part of this committee. And those institutions post a certificate that says that they have the data. And the validator assertions still happen on Ethereum. If there's ever, if the committee ever decides to collude, you can fall back into a rollup. So you have all these defense mechanisms to try and ensure both robustness, decentralization, and security of the network. But in the optimistic case, everything's humming along. You get that 12 cent cost of using the rollup down to like a penny. And we've been using both of these projects and blockchains basically to, 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 to grow different verticals. We tell games, go to Nova, because for your use cases, unless they're very high NFT valued NFT assets, like it makes more sense to be on Nova. You're a DeFi project where 12 cents is not really the high priority of your user base, you know, go to Arbitrum 1. And we're going to see, I think, a lot of that where you know, people take advantage of different ar architectures, a modular blockchain architecture where you can plug in different data availability committees. But I think fundamentally, a, a lot of it will settle, or if not all of it, will ultimately settle on Ethereum from a security perspective. I think one thing that you'll see in the L2s, and this is, you know, Arbitrum is focused on this now, is Everyone's focused on the EVM, the importance of you know, having support for Solidity, making it really easy for developers to build smart contracts. And Ethereum is obviously very focused on EVM and Solidity. That's what it can support. But you have environments on L2s that can be more flexible. So Arbitrum, we're talking about now, you know, right now we have full EVM compatibility and support, but how do we have other languages supported on Arbitrum? So we're going to be starting with other languages like Rust, 
and C++ and move other languages and bring them into the same environment and they can be composable with, you know, solidity contracts. You can't do that on Ethereum, but you can have a lot of this experimentation on something like Arbitrum. Another example of this is a lot of the ZK rollups have been experimenting with account abstraction, you know, before Ethereum's account abstraction or EIP4337 is implemented. So I think what you'll see is different flavors of data availability, trade-offs between costs and full security of Ethereum, and also experimentation around product, user experience, developer experience that can happen on L2s that ultimately settle back to L1. The key principle is that these, these projects will settle back to L1 because fundamentally nobody has solved, well, going back to the scalability trilemma, nobody has solved this. And Ethereum is you know, by far the farthest along in, in separating execution, data availability, and sort of security of the networks. Most of my listeners will be aware of the fact that there's some competitive nature in the different chains, meaning Ethereum is competitive with other chains like potentially Ceramic or Gnosis Chain, Solana, these things. My question is, is there a similar type of competitive environment at the L2 level as well? Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely competitive. I think that you know, there's a bunch of different teams that are building optimistic rollups. There's a bunch of teams that are building ZK rollups. Competitive? But at the same time, you know, most of the teams, they get along well, they have the utmost respect. We're all really aligned in this vision of scaling Ethereum. Um, and I think that's really important. We have a shared goal. We have differences in how to get there, sometimes strong differences and, you know, fundamental differences in opinion. Uh, but everybody's focused on that goal. And I think, frankly, we're all better off for the fact that you have, you know, a diversity of teams that are solving for this. You know, today, Arbitrum, in terms of rollups, is about 50% market share in terms of rollup adoption. But we know that there's incredible teams that are building that are trying to catch up, get their technology as advanced as possible to, to capture that. And it fuels us to continue to get better. And the entire ecosystem benefits um, from this competition. I, I do think, though, that what makes it so great is, you know, I think overwhelmingly, it's extremely collaborative. I have very good relationships with a lot of people with the Starkware team, for example, you know, an amazing team that's building on ZK role of technology. And you know, we're excited to see each other succeed and you know, see the innovations of, that we're, we're all you know, looking at. Well, I want to break down two important points for listeners from the Graph community and, and others that might be listening, and then ask you some questions about the Graph. But the breakdown is, you know, there's been two announcements. I referenced one earlier as it relates to the graph in Arbitrum. The first one was that the graph is scaling to Arbitrum to bring down the cost. And this is going to be going into effect at the graph. The other announcement that was made was in relationship to the graph's MIPS program, which is a special program. Their indexers are onboarding new chains. And so it lo- the program launched with the announcements of Gnosis Chain, then Polygon, and then four chains. And one of those four chains was Arbitrum. So two really important kind of initiatives right now happening within the Graph community as it relates to Arbitrum. When did you first become aware of the Graph? And do you recall kind of what your first impressions were of what the protocol was doing? Yeah, I actually remember it. It was one of, I was probably two or three weeks into my job at Arbitrum or Off-Chain Labs. And we had a call with a bunch of folks from the Graph team. And I'm like, wow, these guys are really smart. Um, and I remember thinking about like the vision that they had, you know, the problem they're trying to solve, like you know, decentralizing access to this information. And that's an example of a problem that's incredible to solve it, right? It's unbelievable to be able to have, you know, democratization of this and you know, making it permissionless to be able to digest all this data. That's incredible. That was my first reaction of like, wow, this is what they're trying to do. This seems extremely smart. Obviously, over time, I've worked more closely with. Tegan, for example, from Edge and Node, and Kyle as well, business development efforts, understanding what, what we can do to help support. And yeah, it's been, it's been great working with, with the team at the graph. We're obviously super excited that they're leveraging Arbitrum infrastructure to make the costs of being part of the network you know, cheaper, as well as you know, the program for decentralization of you know, the subgraphs as well. And you know, so it's, it's amazing to see the innovation happening there. I've you know, had some exposure to like the streaming fast you know, project as well. You know, I'm not as familiar with it as working with the Edge of Node contributors, but 
you know, it's amazing to see how all these different teams are contributing back into the graph ecosystem. And it's an, an extremely ambitious problem to solve. And it's incredible to see sort of the progress that's been made. Do you know if Arbitrum uses the graph? I mean, I've already mentioned that the graph is obviously scaling to Arbitrum infrastructure to bring costs down. But I'm curious if the reciprocal is true. Yeah, we use the graph in our bridge. So that's really like, from our perspective, we have one like touch point with users. Um, and that's the graph where we basically want to be able to um, surface data for users crossing the bridge, wallet information, et cetera, transaction history. So we, we've deployed some graphs on our bridge. Within the Arbitrum ecosystem, basically, a ton of the applications building on top of Arbitrum obviously take advantage and leverage the graphs infrastructure. You know, Uniswap who uses it for their subgraphs for their analytics, et cetera, and you know, information. But yeah, we definitely um, are extremely reliant on it from an infrastructure perspective. The irony is you know, because we're a blockchain, we don't have that much end user exposure. It's usually applications built on top of us, but in our bridge page, yeah, definitely we've got our we've got our graph nodes running. Given your perspective of the industry, do you have a sense for how important the graph is for Web3 and for it to kind of reach its full potential? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if I'm the best to answer this because I'm not like the most, from a data perspective, the most like savvy technical guy, but it is important, right? The, the, the ability to have confidence in the data that you're digesting, the importance of it being able to be accessible by anyone, the importance of being able to self-host your data and make it like readable is critical. I think what they're doing now is, you know, they've got a ton of adoption. Basically, everybody's using some graphs in, in, in some component. I think it's critical. I think, you know, if we want to have the data component of what's happening on blockchain is digestible, it has to be part of the decentralized stack, essentially. Uh, that's how I think about it in terms of their importance. And I think, you know, I know Tegan is extremely passionate about this. Obviously, the rest of the team is, and I'm sure you are as well. You know, Making the data digestible is an extremely important component of what we're all trying to do. Well, there's a lot of momentum in the graph community, and a lot of it's tied to these announcements related to Arbitrum. I'm super excited to see those costs come down to, to participating in the network, and I'm sure it'll open the door to a lot of people that want to contribute and get involved. What is your future vision of Arbitrum? What does the future look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's tough to know because... We've got this research team, engineering team that has all of these amazing trips up their sleeve. You know, when I joined, we had basically, you know, we built a custom node. We had our own programming language. Then we figure out ways to like use GAF to improve throughput and use WASM instead of our own language. And we've got 10x improvements in throughput and 70% decreases in costs. You know, that was sort of 2021 to 2022 and 2022 to 2023. We're focusing now on how do we make the developer experience, which is very solidity focused, much more expensive to include other languages to be able to use Arbitrum. So I think predicting the future of what it looks like is very difficult because of how quickly the pace of innovation is. The thing I would say is our team is dedicated to solving scale without compromise. That's the goal. We want to have the best in class scaling technologies for Ethereum, make sure we're always using the best research, always contributing the best research always using best-in-class technologies to get there. I think the future for what it looks like is a few public chains like we have today that most applications use. As applications continue to mature, they'll want their own environments, like what we call like application-specific chains that will probably launch as L3s. I think you know we're, we're still a little bit early for seeing the proliferation of those, but as we continue to get more users, you know, I think that will happen. and That'll be a critical component of growth you know, because people want, again, it goes back to those different kind of trade-offs. You know, right now our our public chains are all paid in ETH. Somebody might have a chain they want to have paid in their own their own token if it's a game, right? Like an in-house, an in-game native token for the, you know, for gas experiences, right? So there's going to be a lot of modularity, I think. But our team's commitment is to continue to solve scale with, a, you know, whatever the best-in-class technology is. You know, we often get asked, like, is Arbitrum going to become a ZK rollup one day? And the answer is, I don't know. We don't have a commitment to optimistic rollup versus ZK rollup technology. Our commitment is to scale Ethereum with the best in class technology of the day. Today, from a developer experience, from a cost perspective, there's nothing better than optimistic rollups. And you know, that's what's allowed us to launch you know, a year and a half ago and to, to begin scaling and have you know, the developers onboarding if we didn't, we didn't wait for ZK to be ready or, or, or whatever it is. The future of Arbitrum is a commitment basically to use best-in-class technology to scale Ethereum. 
for listeners who want to learn more about Arbitrum and the community at Arbitrum, what's the best way to, to connect? Yeah, I mean, definitely um, our website, Arbitrum.io, um, Twitter, we're pretty active there, obviously, like most folks in crypto or Web3. Our Discord, tons of stuff to get involved with, whether it's like fun NFT projects that are launching, you want to talk about the technical components. Discord's a great place. And that's just, you know, Arbitrum Discord. I think it's discord.gg slash Arbitrum. You know, you can reach out to our partnerships team through our website. However, we can help. You know, our team is here to, to be helpful. We, you know, we, we're dedicated to working with projects like the graph to, to continue to scale their infrastructure to make it more accessible to the world. And that's our primary focus. Well, AJ, now I'm going to ask you the GRT IQ 10. These are 10 questions I ask each guest of the podcast every week. And I created this as a fun way for listeners to learn new things, try new things, or achieve more with their lives. So are you ready for the GRT IQ 10? Yeah, I'm excited. I might need to think about some of them. So let's go. The GRT IQ 10. This is the way. 10 questions for astronauts floating in space. What book or articles had the greatest impact on your life? That's a good question. I would say reading, um, I think, The Big Short. I think when I think about The Big Short, I think about a lot of the things that sort of got me started, both in real estate and in crypto from like a philosophical perspective. Is there a movie or a TV show that you recommend everybody should watch? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's Good Will Hunting. The um, journey of both, you know, Robin Williams and Matt Damon in that movie, the kind of honesty, like the importance of like honesty with yourself is something that I, every time I watch that movie, I get out of it. Like, I Am I being honest with myself? Am I truly being honest with myself? Am I truly being honest about what do I want to accomplish? Am I truly being honest about what my goals are for myself? Am I pushing myself hard? I think that like a lot of those themes are encapsulated in that movie. If you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? That's a good question. I'm not, this is one of those things about me that people always make fun of. I'm not a music guy. I, I, I can't do two things at once. So when I listen to music, I literally can only, like I, in the car, I don't even listen to music. I, this is a good one. Um, I don't really have one to sit, to be honest, that I would say like that one would specifically stick out. I do remember biking in high school a lot. Um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers album. Californication, I think it was called. But honestly, I don't, I don't really listen to music that much. It's a, it's a weird thing about me. How about this? What's the best advice someone's ever given to you? I would say, I'm trying to think, there's two in my mind that I'm thinking of. One is um, basically be honest with yourself. That's it. Like it was, it came up in the context of me saying something that like it was obvious I didn't really believe in. That was putting me on a path that I probably like was better off not going down. Just be honest with yourself. Be honest with what you want in life. Be honest with what you want to achieve. Be honest with, with what's your priorities, your values, and stick to them. What's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people have learned or know yet? You think you have bigger imposter syndrome than others do, especially on social media. What's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? Best life hack I've discovered for myself cowardly i was like the most inefficient person when it came to scheduling meetings and then cowardly saved my life i don't know if that counts but that's what that's what that's the one i'll choose plug for them they should sponsor the show now <laughs> right based on your own life experiences and observations what's the one habit or characteristic that you think best explains how people find success in life they don't think they're too important to do anything you know, if you're willing to do anything, you don't ever have that sense of, you know, being too important, but you're above that. You, you keep that. Like my dad always says, the grinders are always the winners. You know, you keep doing the things that you want to do and maintain that mentality that you have to do it in your responsibility. And that's the attitude that you'll always, that's how you win. And then the final three questions, AJ, are complete the sentence type questions. The first one is, the thing that most excites me about Web3 is? Self-sovereignty and ownership. And how about this one? If you're on Twitter, then you should be following? Arbitrum. And the graph. And lastly, complete the sentence, I'm happiest when? I'm with my family. The GRT IQ 10. And I show you how deep the 
AJ, thank you so much for doing this interview. You've been generous with your time and it's been very educational introducing a lot of my listeners to Arbitrum and a lot of the exciting things that are going o- over there, as well as some really great analogies to help uh, listeners better understand L2 and blockchain technology. If listeners want to follow you, stay in touch with the work that you're doing, what's the best way for them to stay in touch? Um, best would probably be um, on Twitter, um, AJ Warner 90 or on LinkedIn. It's just, you know, you can find me by my name. Um, those are probably the best ways to, to get in touch for sure. And, you know, feel free to reach out. And if you're looking for a job, we're hiring across the board at Offchain Labs. And um, if you want to build on Arbitrum technology, we're here also to help support you in your journey. Um, thanks, Nick, for having me. It's been great chatting with you. It's been amazing working with the entire graph ecosystem, so many different touch points. And, you know, let's scale crypto, Web3, whatever you want to call it. Let's do it together. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G-R-T-I-Q podcast.